we think that the legislature is being a little too protective uh, of its people here. And we're going to move down the standard of proof for the government in this particular case, or you know, one party versus the other. Typically, in this country, we try to protect the accused, and we believe that those protections are given to us via the Constitution and via these concepts of due process that uh, come to us through the common law, which is where this gets so messy, because the common law would tell you that it's probable cause, and it's some guy in field in New York who's telling you that it should be something else. Well, we could get into uh, all of that, but it would be, I think, more philosophical than anything else, because the state of Idaho didn't do it that way. The state of Idaho, as a territory, adopts a bunch of codes out of California, cut a code that they've already looked at, a code that they've already said, these words clearly mean something more than probable cause. This is the what you're adopting. If you come and get it, the state of Idaho goes and gets it and adopts it. So that's what the state of Idaho is adopting. I obviously recognize that the founders of the, that wrote the Constitution did not appear to recognize what was already on the books in this regard. However, just because they didn't recognize that doesn't mean it's not still part and parcel of what was thought to be true by a large portion of the citizens of Idaho who were the actual ones who ratified the document. The only thing we know is that from 1890 to Edmondson, the Supreme Court of Idaho was repeatedly admonishing prosecutors to stop using a beyond a reasonable doubt standard for a grand jury. And that, it seems to me, is pointing to this concept and if we're going to talk about common practice, the common practice looks to have been that everybody thought that the standard for the grand jury was beyond reasonable doubt. And it, you know, I, I don't think this is like worthy of the parade of uh, nightmares that I've been reading about. Um, obviously, in each one of those cases, the prosecutor was able to pull it up. And little wonder, I mean, it's still a grand jury procedure. Still, just the prosecutor in a room with 16 citizens, 12 of which have to agree, they get control over basically everything that's being put on. I mean, the, the guardrails being put in hey, let's use admissible evidence. You know, hey, let's not pull in hearsay witnesses. That kind of thing is not going to somehow make this impossible and make it so that it can't possibly work. What it's intended to do is just make it so that. If you're in a position to get an indictment against somebody, you're going to put on your, your A game. But obviously, we've been talking a bit about how we don't think that that's what occurred in this particular case. And we certainly don't think that if the court were to adopt this in this particular case, that this would even remotely cut the muster, because we know from the grand jurors that at least six of them wanted to hear more until they were essentially cut off and told probable cause of the standard and what are people doing. You probably should cut that. What what the uh, grand jurors did or didn't do. Fair enough. Good. But I'm just pointing out that there's clearly prejudice in the record that the court can see from what they weren't being instructed. It's also, as we argued, clearly going to be fundamental error. You tell the <coughs> grand jury that. This is the standard, and it's actually something else. You can't possibly think that the result that you're getting is the accurate one, and so you have to do it again. And this, these are these are fundamental rights that people have, and so clearly that would be the way to go. Right, but you just you just agreed that that the court and the case law, going back to I mean, at least Edmondson, uh, have the standard as uh, pro probable cause. Um, so. You know, to just say, well, they gave, they were given the wrong uh, instruction is not exactly the case. I mean, that is the standard that has been used uh, in Idaho for years, maybe a hundred years. It was different. It was different there for a period of time, but after Edmondson, uh, I thought, I, I thought that it was pretty much settled. Now, I understand the argument between substantive and procedural, uh, and that's, you know, that can be a, uh, 
a legitimate argument, but I'm not sure it's fair to just say, well, they were given the wrong instructions if everybody is using that instruction throughout the state. Well, Your Honor, if that were true, then I'm not really sure what I'm doing with my life because I've spent much of it arguing that things that everyone in the state is doing are wrong. True. And occasionally, rarely, but occasionally, somebody says, no, no, that guy's right, and my client walks out of prison. So I, I'm... Well, that's fine. You can make an matters. argument that, that something sh should change, but uh, are, are you telling me that other places in the, in the state are giving a different instruction that it should be beyond a reasonable doubt? What I'm telling you, Court, is that it appears that up until 1980, that was true. And so the Supreme Court enters its rule, sort of has this ruling that talks about that, but nobody's arguing about it because they don't have access to the internet, and nobody has a copy of the field code or what California was up to. Well, Justin Weisslein argued about it in, that, in, uh, in a dissent in uh, Edmondson. And we thank him for it, although. Okay. But if you, you can't go say back, that there hasn't been an argument about it. Well, well, well. No, no, no. If you go back and you read what Justice Beisline did, Justice Beisline didn't know about the field code. He, he knew it came out of California. He knew that it meant something different. I think so it's that, attached on the dissent. Does Some he, of that. No, California. Well, those are earlier. Well, those are the, that's the earlier session. He has the California code, and he has the stuff from the territories. That's what he's got. But he doesn't know. If, I mean, if you read the field code, which apparently nobody did except, you know, Justice Field in California, if you read it, it literally tells you what it's trying to do. It spells it right out. And you can find it for free on Google Books, which is where I got it. I don't have a copy. I'm not even sure where you find it. But except for Google Books, you can find this thing, and they, they have a whole preamble to how they're trying to save the concept of the grand jury. They want it to be better than what it is. They understand people have concerns about it. Let's make it better. And it gets adopted in California, and then we took it from that. I mean, that's what I think should matter. And the fact that the plain language of the statute is being read by every prosecutor in the state up until the 80s when the Supreme Court finally gets them to stop, because the statute's relatively clear. And so the only person who's pushing back against this are these Idaho Supreme Court justices that don't like it. But there's nobody coming to them and saying, here's a copy of the field code. This is where this all comes from. This was the point. Instead, there's just this concern that who could possibly want such a thing? How would we be safe if our communities are only able to indict people beyond a reasonable doubt? It's just too much. It's too high a state. That's hard to believe, given how many of these cases are making it up, because they were convicted. There's no reports anywhere that I was able to find that in the state of Idaho, all these prosecutors were mistaken and even beyond a reasonable doubt. There's just like no indictments going on. Nobody was going to prison. Nobody was getting the death penalty. It was a free for all, and uh, we had you know posse's riding around and having to deliver justice because the standard was too high at the grand jury proceeding. But that's not what was occurring. What you had was a perfectly well-running system that you had uh, Supreme Court justices that were not aware of where this stuff was coming. If somebody had come to them and said it, we'd have a ruling on it. But nobody did. And in fact, we don't have really any state that's ever done the heavy work of this. You've got the New York Court of Appeals, uh, is about the only one who was aware because it happened there. And they've kind of let it drain away over time. Well, other states can do what they want. They can, they can pass new statutes. Their constitutions are older than ours, etc. Our constitution was written in 1890. So it's going to lock in what the people thought that they had as their law and what they considered to be their standard of due process at that time. And the only history we have is we've got a Supreme Court saying, you don't have that right. We've got a bunch of prosecutors, of all people, thinking that we do. And that's, I mean, that's what you're looking at. The fact that the rest of the country is off doing other things, I don't think necessarily matters. What matters in terms of the courts, the courts has to read 
plain language of the statute, the court has to consider the fact that, at the very least, California knew what it was up to, and that the, even if the people who wrote our Constitution didn't know what was going on, that doesn't mean that the people who wrote the Idaho Revised Statutes in 1887 didn't know what they were signing on for. And it, whether or not they were sitting at the Constitutional Convention isn't something that I put enough effort into to figure that one out, but I don't think it necessarily answers the question anymore. Um, anyway, I think the, the only other thing I wanted to touch on was how, by agreeing with me, the court uh, is able to save the indictment by turning it into a presentment. Is a presentment. There's a lot laxer uh, evidentiary rules and everything else. Much of the complaints we would have about it essentially disappear, and the state has its presentment. And for, as far as I'm told, one of the reasons why we had a grand jury in this case is because in another case, I'd argue that if you don't do a grand jury, you can't have the death penalty, which I still believe. But if you have a presentment, that's also listed. And so the state still gets what it wants. And we get a preliminary hearing, which it seems to me would be worth the candle for us. I think there, there was a, some instruction about present, uh, present, in, or present uh, for the grand jury, was it not? They, they, gave, they were given that option? Well, I think they were told about it. So I don't know if I mean, the court Maybe we can find it. I can't find a single presentment in the history of Idaho. Um, so I don't know if they've really ever been used. Uh, but, I don't know. But, and I hadn't really even thought about what they are or what they meant until taking up this argument. But from what I could tell, going back to the field code and, and looking at everything else and the statutes that we have on hand, I mean, essentially, it's like grand jury light. Uh, typically, for the presentment, the idea for who is getting the presentment seems to come from the grand jury members themselves. Uh, they just come in with some information about somebody, they make an accusation like it's a complaint, and then it goes off and it gets treated more like a complaint than it does an event. I don't know if the court found anything otherwise, but that's the way that it appears to supposed to work. Like I said, I don't know if anybody's ever done one, but I do think that what the state accomplished in the indictment in this proceeding would easily meet the requirements for present. Uh, and I don't think we would have any real ability to, to argue with them. Because I mean, if the grand jury itself can just come in and say, these are some facts I heard from my neighbor, and I think that guy committed a crime, and that's enough to start the wheels of justice, then I'm relatively certain we've met that uh, requirement. And so if the court does that, then the state still has a piece of paper that says the death penalty can be sought in the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution. And a preliminary hearing would be offered to give us the ability to take a closer look at this case than what was given at the actual grand jury. So, you know, and then everybody can win. Uh, I do have that as an option for the court. Does the court have any? Questions? You, it looks like you might. I I might uh, on your reply. Okay. We'll see. Thank you. Thank you, and Mr. Nye. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, as much as I enjoy following through legislative history, as a trial attorney, we usually have a shortcut, and that is we check to see if the Idaho Supreme Court has ruled on the issue. And in this case, it has uh, multiple times. So in Edmondson, the Supreme Court said, and I quote, the purpose of the grand jury proceeding is to determine whether sufficient probable cause exists to bind the defendant over for trial. The determination of guilt or innocence is saved for a later day. As long as the grand jury has received legally sufficient evidence, which in and of itself supports the finding of probable cause, it is not for an appellate court to set aside the indictment. This court is bound by that holding. Uh, the Idaho Supreme Court applied that holding in two subsequent cases, Martinez and Jones, both cited in my brief. 
the Court of Appeals has applied that holding repeatedly. This court is also bound by its holdings. Um, the only other thing I would add is, to summarize Mr. Robinson's argument, um, Idaho law supports it as long as you ignore the Idaho Supreme Court. California law supports it as long as you ignore the California Supreme Court. Idaho's constitutional history supports it as long as you ignore the Founding Fathers. Uh, I could go on, but there's nothing to see here. The Idaho Supreme Court has ruled on this, and this court is not right. Unless the court has any questions, I'll rest on that. Thank you, Mr. Knight. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Logsdon, do you want to add anything else? Well, that's just not what happened. I mean, Judge, courts say things all the time. We call it dicta. When a court is listing off... Sometimes we call it the law. Sometimes. <laughs> but what we're talking about when we talk about evidence is we're talking about dicta. I mean, nobody was arguing in that case that probable cause was the standard. They were arguing over whether or not it's fair that some people get a prelim and some people get a grand jury. That's what that argument was about. And the guy didn't come in and say, oh no, uh, I got a grand jury and the standard is beyond a reasonable doubt, but that's too, I don't like that, I'd rather have a prelim with a probable cause standard. That doesn't occur in that case for various, I'm sure, fantastic reasons. And the same thing happens in these later cases. I mean, it gets responded to. And yeah, it, like I said, the Supreme Court adopted a rule but it's never tested the constitutionality of its own rule. It's never heard arguments on any of these things. It doesn't, it's not stating a holding after an argument. What it's doing is it's just reviewing what it believes the law to be that nobody's picking a fight about. I'm picking a fight about it. And, and you may have the opportunity to do that to the Supreme Court. Well, I mean, that's what you're and, building. And that's, that's what you're building for. Because you know, you know that I am constrained by the by existing law. I can't just change the law as a trial court uh, if it's established. And I would say that in in Edmondson uh, there wasn't an argument because it was they were it was settled law. I mean, I think that's really really the problem. So. Um, of course, a lot happened from, you know, 1880, 1890 to now, uh, but the law doesn't always just sit still. I mean, it evolves, and uh, that may be just what happened naturally. I, I, I'm not, I don't agree that uh, this, the language of the statute is completely clear, too. I mean, I think you can interpret it uh, differently different ways, and a lot of people have interpreted that language different ways, whether it's beyond a, a, beyond a reasonable a doubt or a probable cause. And, and you, can, you can argue with me about that. I, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm kind of baiting you about that, so. Judge, the cases that say that are very self-serving. These are, these are courts that are essentially openly hostile to the idea of using a beyond reasonable doubt standard. And so they they make claims like to warrant really means to permit the trial jury to see it. That's not the wording of this statute. The California case gets written in the backdrop of a statute being passed in the, the 1940s that says probable cause is what you're going to look at when you're deciding whether or not these indictments should stand. So it really doesn't the whether or not the grand jury is being told something else to some extent turns into a new point. The, um, I mean, the reality is, just because the courts didn't like what the legislature did up, and in our case, unlike California, unlike New York, but what was part of the concept of due process in our Constitution was written, just because the Supreme Court doesn't like it, doesn't mean it's somehow settled law because it refuses to follow it. It has to actually have a case and determine it. Now, occasionally, they can uh, pass rules, like they did, 
And so that's where this whole question of whether or not this is a substantive right and a procedural right comes. But they've never ruled on it. And the, Your Honor has the ability to look at the whole mess, the totality, and say, what is the law? What was the law in 1890? And when did it change? I don't think what the court can write is an opinion that says, well, we don't know when or how it changed, but by 1890, clearly the, the probable cause was the same in the state of There has to be something where the Supreme Court considers these things in order for it to be settled law in, in a way that in which your court, your honor, would be right and say, I, I can't do anything about it. They've never settled this question because nobody ever brought it up. Because it's really hard to get a copy of the field code in 1913. Well, I, mean, I don't know. But it was, was well, there was, uh, there was a, I can't remember the name right at the moment, but in the 1950s, it was dicta uh, where, where the, the judge, the appellate judge, said, no, it, that's not the standard because they were using the unreasonable doubt in that case. Starts with a G. But anyway, um, there, was a, there was a discussion um, in that case about what the standard of proof uh, is or should be uh, in the grand jury. So there have been touches of that along the way, I think. But, um, but you're right, there's not a whole lot of law until maybe Edmondson that was pretty clear. And then, and then as Mr. Knight pointed out, a couple of uh, decisions after that, this that uh, case, which I think was 1987, maybe, something like that. So, um, yeah, I mean, I appreciate, I appreciate your argument. I mean, it's, it's interesting. I'm constrained by the law, though. Back to that. The, You're making a record. That's good. Judge. Had made a decision. Held some things. It's true. But nobody was arguing about that standard of proof. The fact that they stated, while they're walking through what a grand jury is versus what a preliminary hearing is, it, it, that doesn't settle what the standard is. Just because they said it doesn't make it the law. I think we. The, they have, their jurisdiction is limited, and yet broader than the United States Supreme Court. Although, if you read that most recent opinion where Judge Stegner doesn't agree with any of them about what their jurisdiction is like, it gets kind of complicated. But the point is, they can't, uh, they can't just say in an opinion where nobody's arguing anything, oh, and by the way, the law of the land is this. Nobody briefed this issue in that Nobody briefed it in any of the cases that came after it. They didn't set in stone, via that opinion, what the standard is. They tried by adopting the rule. The rule is, a, is the question. The court has to try to figure out, is it a procedural right or a substantive right? If the court says it's a procedural right, and essentially what the court is saying is that the courts get to decide how much it takes for one of us to be thrown in the lockup, put to death, etc. Which I can't find any case that has ever said that. They've all said that the standards being set by the Constitution or the legislature, setting these standards over and over and over again. So for the Idaho Supreme Court to issue a rule setting the standard of proof, even though there is a statute that says otherwise, they can't do that. That didn't become something that, I mean, they did it. But the court is in a position to consider whether or not they could do it. The court can tell the Idaho Supreme Court this rule isn't constitutional. Courts can do that. I mean, we consider um, bail. Uh, issues, uh, you consider bail, bail on appeal, things like that, statute versus procedural rights, those things occur. And the lower court can look at that like anybody else can. Who's in the right? 
Is it the legislature or is it the court? So I think the court can decide all these things. But if the court's going to say it can't, I hope you'll at least write a 32-page order in which you explain how right I am about everything except. Thank you. I'll work on that. Thank you. Uh, I, I appreciate the argument. I think it's really uh, creative. Um, and I appreciate the journey back through history. I think, I think it is an important um, factor in determining what the law is and why the law was established the way it was. But even you, okay, and I, I've heard this, but even in your, in your brief, and I'll, I'll, this, is, this, is quote, this is your quote, okay, that the whole of modern jurisprudence on the issue is against it, as well as the least, as well as the least one founding father of this state. So, I, I get it. I mean, my, I, what it comes down uh, to me is that uh, I am constrained by what I believe is settled law in Idaho. I may be wrong, uh, but this is, this is certainly a, an issue that you would have to bring up with a higher court, um, like the Idaho Supreme Court. Uh, and I, I look forward to you know, getting that, uh, from your perspective, settled in Idaho. We'll see. Um, you know, there's the there's the there's the uh, rule, of course, which as you know we've talked about. But this argument really does is fighting against some case law, uh, too. Uh, you may say that it's all dicta. I mean that's uh, debatable, I suppose. Uh, but the Idaho criminal rule, specifically Rule 6.5a. Uh, expressly states that probable cause is the standard not beyond a reasonable doubt and uh, for a grand jury's indictment. And I think I have three or four recent, because this, this argument has been circulating in the state, I think I've had three or four district judge decisions uh, denying the motion and the argument. So, I am going to deny that uh, that argument. I think the argument is good, but I can't go that far. Uh, not today. Uh, I'll give you a written decision. I can't guarantee it's going to be 32 pages. It might be longer. It might be shorter. So we'll see. But it's always uh, enjoyable to have an argument uh, with you, Mr. Lawson. So. Um, I think that's all we have to do still. Ms. Taylor? That's it for today, Your Honor. Okay, and Mr. Thompson? Yes, sir. We're done for today. Okay, nothing else to address then. Okay, well, uh, I hope you all got a touch of Idaho history and the law and how it works and uh, our Idaho and United States Constitution. So. <coughs> Go out and uh, learn some more. Okay? Thank you all. We're adjourned.